Thank you, Angela. Thank you, thank you. Good morning. It is good to see you all this morning. Let's all stand as we sing Love Lifted Me. or stay standing. I know you want to sit. We're going to honor uh, God and his word. We're going to be reading this morning from Ephesians chapter 3. It'll be up on the screen for you. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. It says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Church, I want you to know this morning as we read God's word, I read Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, and I think about a God who is able to do abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. I'm here to celebrate this morning. On January 1st, we began praying for 30 people to be baptized. Church, in the Hispanic service this Sunday, we reached our baptism goal, and so we give honor and glory to God. Thank you guys for praying so much. Here's the deal, though. You don't get to stop praying. We're praying that God will continue to do abundantly more. He's already done that. We are at 31 now. Uh, and so we're just going to start adding pluses the rest of the year until December 31st. So keep praying that God would continue to work in lives, that people would be saved, uh, and that people would be baptized as well. And so let's just do that. Before we continue in worship this morning, 
Uh, would you pray with me? Uh, and then after I pray, uh, you may be seated. And so, Father, this morning I ask, God, you have done abundantly more than we could ever imagine at RF1. And so, God, we, we celebrate. God, we celebrate the fact of you saving souls. God, we celebrate obedience, God, and we celebrate that you answer prayers. And so, Lord, there is still work to be done. God, we pray that by December 31st, God, that you would just continue to add pluses. God, that there would continue to be people and lives changed, God. That, that the baptismal waters, God, would continue to be filled. And we just give you all glory and honor. And we ask that you would continue, God, to work in this church. And we pray this in your awesome name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning again. What great news to hear that we have exceeded uh, our baptism goal. Uh, we're excited about, about that, and we're going to be announcing pretty soon a uh, celebration uh, for that. But I do have a few announcements this morning. First, uh, right after service in the Welcome Center, they're going to be selling again uh, the T-shirts uh, for uh, Angie Hinkle. Uh, and we would encourage you to, to help support her during this time and especially to be in prayer for her uh, as, as she is, is battling cancer. And we just ask that you would pray uh, and support her as a church. Uh, also, uh, tonight at 5 o'clock, right here in the sanctuary, the choir will begin uh, practicing for the Christmas cantata. Uh, so if, if you are going to be singing in the Christmas, Christmas cantata, uh, be here at 5 o'clock. Uh, to begin the practices for that. Uh, this Tuesday, uh, we will have our senior luncheon. Uh, and so at 11.30 in the new fellowship hall, uh, if you have any questions about how to get there, you can talk to me or Christian or one of the other staff or Peggy Branscombe uh, if you have any questions. But at 11.30 on Tuesday, we'll have the senior luncheon. Uh, and so put that on your calendars. Also mark your calendars for October the 26th. That's a Wednesday night. Uh, on that Wednesday, uh, we'll not have our regular Bible study, our children's programs, or youth, uh, as we will all be going over to the Ellis' house uh, to just have a fall celebration there. Uh, there'll be food, fun, uh, fellowship, uh, hay rides, and lots of fun things. And so uh, we'll be going over there on October the 26th. A little more information about that uh, will be coming up soon. Uh, we're also in the season of collecting money for the Eliza Broadus missions offering. Uh, and so if you haven't already given, I'd ask that you would pray about how you can support Eliza Broadus missions offering. Uh, the money for, from that goes to support uh, missionaries right here in the state of Kentucky. Uh, and so it stays home uh, and does some great things right around us uh, here in the state of Kentucky. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Johnny, uh, our youth minister, is in Southeast Asia this morning uh, on a mission himself, and he has a message uh, for us. Hey, RS1, it's me, Johnny. Good morning, good morning. Hope you guys are having a great Sunday. Just wanted to say hi and just that I love you guys and appreciate all your prayers. Uh, it's been a wonderful week out here, uh, just getting to share God's love and going through the countryside of this country and just going through different villages and seeing people and meeting people and just uh, getting to share the love of God with everybody we see. It's been a great week. Uh, continue to pray for us as we travel along. We leave in a couple days, so we appreciate your support. And just uh, thank you guys for sending me out here. I can't wait to see you guys again. Okay, have a great day. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing. Jesus Christ. 
Let us pray. Father, we just want to come to you this morning, Lord, just lifting you high, Lord, praising your name. Lord, thank you for the increase that that you've given your kingdom through us here at First Baptist with 30 baptisms, Lord. We just give you the glory for that. And, Lord, today, Lord, if there's one, Lord, that is without you that needs to pass from death unto life to receive your, your saving grace, Lord, I just pray that today is the day of salvation. Lord, we just pray for Christian as he comes and brings your word. May we be attentive. May we apply it to our lives, and may we respond accordingly. And we ask these things in, in our Savior and your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Man, this is an awesome crowd for a fall break. You guys are amazing. You want to come to church even during fall break, and so praise God for that. Uh, if you are a guest, we just started a new series. The new series is called One and Done. Why is it called One and Done? Because during the month of October, we are looking at the five books of the Bible that have one chapter. And so in the 66 books, we see there are five separate books that have only one chapter, and we are looking at all of those books. And this morning, we, we're not going in order that you see in your Bible. So this morning, we are looking at 2 John. So go ahead, take your Bibles, turn to the end of your Bibles in the book of 2 John. 2 John, one of, in fact, it is the shortest book in the English translation of the scriptures. Uh, and it's very short, very sweet, but man, it has a very powerful message for us. A as you turn there, uh, I want to announce we have decided, and this was a very quick decision, but we are going to have a party to throw a celebration for our baptisms. And so on October 30th, if you want to mark down in your calendars, on October 30th, during the Sunday school hour, instead of having Sunday school, we are going to have a party. And here's what we're going to do. Because you got dunked, we are going to celebrate with Dunkin' Donuts, all right? And so we're going to have Dunkin' Donuts there at 9 o'clock in the new fellowship hall. We'll have coffee, iced coffee, uh, lots of goodies for you guys. That'll be a time of fellowship for us to celebrate what the Lord has done. And so look at Second John. In fact, we're going to read, because it's so short, let's just go ahead and read the entire book. Second John, verse 1, says this. It says, The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father, Son, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in truth, just as you were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we've had from the very beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching, both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greetings. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked work. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face, so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. That's the book of Second John. So here's what we're going to see in this morning's message, is that it's a very simple message. It's a message that the two concepts we're going to look at this morning is something that you already know about. But what we're going to see, sometimes in the, the simplistic of messages, it's something, usually it's the most simple messages that we need to continue to hear. And we're going to see that in Second John. And so let's start with the greeting. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the greeting, and then we're going to look at the conclusion, and then we're going to look at verses 4 through 11, the body of this letter. And so John, as most of the epistles, uh, most of the letters in the New Testament, he gives this general greeting that we see in verse 1. The greeting he gives is the elder, which is John, to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth. And so John is writing to this elect lady. Now, now here's the question we have to ask. Who is the elect 
lady. There is, um, in the scholarly world, there is a divide between who this specific elect lady is. Some scholars believe that the elect lady and her children is a specific woman. That this was an individual woman that John wrote to. She might have been having people come into her house to worship, and it might have been her house was a gathering for believers. And so some people believe that this elect lady was a specific woman who had kids who John is writing to. This definitely could be the case. In fact, in 3 John, which we're going to look at next week, he writes to one specific person. It's a man named Gaius, uh, and so we'll see that next week. But other scholars believe, and I tend more to believe on this side of things, that the elect lady is a metaphor of the church. That, that when John is writing to the elect lady, he says to the elect lady and her children, he's writing to a specific congregation, which would go off the metaphor of Jesus talks about the church is the bride of Christ. And so both ways make sense. Either uh, whichever way you choose to believe doesn't affect so much the letter in itself or what we learn from it. But either way, we're going to learn that he's writing to a group of believers. And in this introduction, here's what he's setting up. In fact, you probably saw this in the introduction. There was one word mentioned several times, and it was the word truth. He says the word truth, and then he finishes his introduction. He says, grace and mercy and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father, Son, in truth and in love. And so John, is what he's doing, he's setting up exactly what he's getting ready to tell us. He talks about truth. He talks about love. Church this morning, we're talking about two simple concepts that you know about, that you hear about several Sundays, but it's so important we need to continue to talk about it, and it's that idea of truth and love. And so this is the introduction. But let's look at the conclusion. Verse 12, he says this. He says, though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I would hope to come to you and talk face to face. Here's what John's saying. He says, look, he says to the elect lady and her children, man, I I got a whole lot I need to tell you. But like there are a bunch of things that we need to go over. Uh, I want to see you face to face. I want to tell you these things, but gosh, my my hands hurt and I don't want to write anymore. In fact, I don't want to waste any more paper. So you know what I'm going to do? He's going to write what's important. So so there, there was something they needed to know that he could tell them face to face. But for some reason, what we see is even though this is a short letter, he uses this short letter to show people, especially this elect lady and her children, something very specific, something very important that they need to know. See, John's plan was to meet with them later and discuss a bunch of things face to face, but there were some things that could not wait. And this is what we get in 2 John, the very important letter that is short, sweet, and to the point. In fact, you're going to see in this that John makes the most of being one and done. So look at verse 4. Let's get to the body of this letter. Verse 4 says this. He says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in truth, just as you were commanded by the Father. That there is this great rejoicing. Why? But because he sees that there's this group of Christians that are walking in the truth. This brought great joy to John. Parents, you understand this. When your children, let's say you go to a parent-teacher conference, and the teacher says, man, little Bobby, you won't believe what he did. He gave up some of his lunch money for another student. You rejoice in that. When your students walk in truth, or when they obey the things that you have taught them, or they do right, you rejoice in this. This is what John's doing. He's rejoicing in the truth that they are walking in. In fact, church, it is my biggest joy as a pastor when I see you and when I hear about things that you are doing in the community to show the love of God. Nothing brings me more joy than when when I hear from outside, hey, this so-and-so person did this for me, or hey, they prayed for me, or hey, this family, man, they mean a lot to me because of the way they show Christ to me. That brings me joy as a pastor. And so John is saying, I rejoice greatly to hear that you are walking in truth. But why does this bring him so much joy? Why does this bring me so much joy as a pastor? It's because this, it's because when we are walking in truth, you know what we're doing? When we're walking in truth, we are aligning ourselves with the will of God. When we're walking in truth, we're simply aligning ourselves with the will of God. This is why it's so important. But let's answer this question, why is it so important to walk in truth? In fact, what does it mean to walk in truth? Well, John chapter 17, verse 17, gives us a little example. Jesus says this in John 17, 17. He says, sanctify them in the truth. And then Jesus goes on to say this. He says, your word is truth. 
And, and so walking in truth is walking according to what? The Word of God. God's Word is truth. And so to walk in truth means that we're walking according to the Word of God. In other words, walking in truth is walking according to the commandments that God has given us. And so when it comes to the commandments that God has given us, here's what we believe as a church. In this book, there are 66 Bibles, or 66 books within this Bible. All books are written by 40-some-odd different authors, but guess what? They all tell one story. They're either pointing to Jesus or pointing back at what Jesus has done. And all of these authors, all with probably around 40 different authors, they were all under the inspiration of one specific author who was the Holy Spirit. And so we understand that the words in this book, that they are not just made-up words and they're not just men's word. No, these are God's words words which we believe is truth why because god can't lie titus chapter 1 verse 2 says in hope of eternal life which god who never lies in fact it's impossible for god to lie why it's against his very character god cannot lie what he says is truth and his word as jesus said is truth and so when it comes to walking in truth here's what we need to do when it comes to walking in truth, as a church and, and as Christians and as disciples, here's what we are called to do. We are called to create habits of truth. We're to create for ourselves habits of walking in truth. Now, how do you create a habit? Some of us, some of us have got bad habits, right? Amen. Some of us got really good habits or we try to create good, maybe healthy habits for, for our lifestyle. How do we create habits? How do you create it? Through what? Repetition. You, you create habits through continuing to do the same thing over and over. A habit is created through consistency. The, the New York Times, they, uh, they, they posted this article I was reading this week. It, it says that there was this group of British researchers, uh, and, and they began to research people uh, doing simple tasks that they wanted to continue to do. Something like drinking water in the morning or going on a walk before dinner. And, and so they published this, this study in the Journal of Social Psychology, and, and here's what it showed. It showed that the amount of time it took for a task to become automatic, in other words, the time for it took for a specific task to become a habit ranged from 18 to 254 days, with that median time being about 66 days. You've heard before that it takes 21 days to form a habit. That is true sometimes, but sometimes it takes a lot longer. In this study, they found it could take from 18 to 254 days. And so for any time, in any time in life, whether it's wanting to drink water, whether it's wanting to eat healthier, whatever it might be, we know it takes consistency to maintain and establish some kind of habit. In church, we have to understand it takes consistency for us as Christians to learn how to walk in truth. For, for us to create a specific habit of walking in truth, it's going to take day, 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 day after day, day after day, time after time, us doing those same things that we find in Scripture to establish a life where we continually and constantly walk in truth. Because here's the deal. We know we're not to walk in truth just a few days a week. Walking in truth is not something we just do on Sunday. No, no, walking in truth, if you are truly walking in truth, you're doing it all the time. You're doing it consistently. But, but here's what we see. The only way to walk in truth every day is two things, and I believe this. The only way for us to walk in truth every day is, number one, you have to know the truth you're supposed to be walking in. In order for you to walk in truth, you have to know that very truth that you are supposed to to be walking in. So, so let me ask this question, and this is personal, this is for all of us, and trust me, I've asked this myself this week. Uh, let's do a test. What is, ask yourself this question, what is your knowledge of the Word of God? Think about that. You specifically, not your family, not your past, what is your knowledge of God's Word? Let, let's say, let, let's rank it on a scale of 1 to 10. Let's say 10 being Jesus and His perfect knowledge, and so nobody in here is a 10. And then a one being someone who has never picked up a Bible or even heard of a Bible before. What's your knowledge of God's Word? I'll be honest, I'd be almost embarrassed to answer that question. To consider, what would you rate yourself? Would you give yourself a, some of y'all like probably, probably an eight? Nah, probably not. Am I five? Am I four? What is my true knowledge? Because if this is truth, and we're going to see the importance of truth in just a moment and for us to understand that to walk in truth, we have to know the truth. How much do we actually know about 
God's truth. So see, I don't want us to think about it this way, though. I don't want us to think, well, pastor, I, I just got to gotta study this thing, and I just got to master this book. I don't want you to think that way. Because here's the deal. There are some very, very smart people who literally their whole lives get paid to study the Bible. There's all these scholars and theologians that that's their job. And guess what? They still haven't mastered God's Word. The only one to master God's Word truly is Christ, who is the Word. He is an embodiment of all things in the Word. You're not going to master the Bible. And so I don't want you to get stressed out. Well, well, Christian, I just don't have time to study the Bible all the time. And I just don't know if I can master it. I don't know all the words and what it's talking about. The point is not to master the word. In fact, I have a, a master's in theology. And here's what I learned in my master's in theology. I learned a lot, but I really learned that I don't know as much about the word as I think. So, so what's the goal? My, my buddy said this. He's a pastor from First Baptist Pain School out in Eastern Kentucky. He tweeted this the other day. He says, don't seek to master the Bible. Seek to be mastered by it. And so when it comes to us, in order for us to walk in truth, we have to know the word. But the goal is not to truly master God's word. It's not, yes, you want to know it and you want to understand what's in there. But I think the goal when we're reading scripture for us to understand how to walk in truth is we want to be mastered by his word. That as we read, it guides our lives. And so if you don't have a good knowledge of the Word of God, you're going to have issues trying to know how to follow it. And, and so number two, the only way we walk in truth every day is number one, we, we got to know the truth, but number two, we have to immerse ourselves in the Word of God. Psalms 119.11, you've probably memorized this, it says, I have stored your Word up in my heart that I may not sin against God. One of the beautiful Psalms that the psalmist has written for us. And so the question is, I believe for us to immerse ourselves in God's word, we have to store his word in our hearts. But how do we store his word in our hearts? In a world today where you can download or you can airdrop whatever it is, you can't do that when it comes to God's word. How do you store his word in your heart? How do you store it so that it can master you, so that it can affect your life? Well, three things very quickly, and these are not profound. It's just simple that we preach several times up here in the pulpit, and it's this. It's consistent Bible reading, Bible memorization, and Bible meditation. I, I told you guys, today's a simple message. How do I know the truth? It's through simple acts of Bible reading, Bible memorization, and Bible meditation. Sometimes we, we, try, to make the, we try to make the Christian walk more difficult than it is. We try to overcomplicate things, but if we take the time to, to simply read God's Word in long sections and, and read books of God's Word and, and read it constantly and read it for more than five minutes at a time, if we take the time to, to memorize the Scripture, let it soak within our minds, if we take the time to meditate, even if it's just on one verse for that entire day, we're going to see our lives be transformed, and we're going to see it's going to affect the way that we walk in truth. And so the truth needs to become a part of our daily lives. It needs to become a habit. But look with me at verse 5. Verse 5, it says this. It says, And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one that we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. John is basically saying this. He's saying, look, I'm not here to write you guys anything new. I'm, I'm not. I'm just reminding of you of what is of utmost importance. And what is that? It's to love one another. Church, I'm not here trying to preach to you something new and profound. You know, sometimes I write my sermons and I'm like, gosh, I, I wish I could think of just something profound that could, and sometimes my flesh, I'm like, man, I just wish I could think of something that could wow the, the crowd. But that's not the goal. And that should never be my thinking anyways. In this message, RS1, this is nothing new. This is something, we, this is the simplest of messages. We, we teach it in, in our, in our two-year-old class. We teach it in vacation Bible school. We, we teach it, but we also teach it to us this morning, and this is the idea that we are to love one another. Think about John. He had tons of things that he needed to tell this group of believers. He had tons of things, but he says, look, I don't want to waste any more pen and ink. Here's what I want to do. I want to come to you face to face, but for now, this is what you need to know. We know this is of utmost importance that John says, okay, I, I can tell you all other things later, but this you need to know. You need to love one another. It's good to know basic truth. It's good to remind ourselves of basic truth because sometimes we slack. It's good to remind ourselves what's most important. In fact, Jesus talked about love being the greatest commandment. Look what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 3. He says, if I don't have love, I have gained 
nothing. And so the idea of love, yes, it's like, oh, Christian, here we are at church talking about love again. Love, love. Here, Do you see how important love is? Paul uh, mentions it. John mentions it again. Jesus says it's the most important commandment. If you don't have love, Paul says, guess what? You don't have anything. It's a basic truth, but it's something that we need to know. And then look at verse 6. In case you didn't know what love is, John goes ahead and he defines it for us. Because this is love. That we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment just that you have heard from the beginning so that you should walk in it. What, what's the definition of love? Man, man I, I think if we ask this to culture, if I went out in society and I just began interviewing people, what's the definition of love? We're going to get a lot of different answers, aren't we? We're, we're going to get some, some, some silly answers. I mean, we, we, could, we could go all around Russell County and just interview people of what your definition of love is, and I couldn't imagine the answers that we would get back. And sometimes we complicate that, that idea of, of what true love is, but here's what the Bible defines love as. Here's what John defines it as. It says love is simply that we walk according to God's commandments. In other words, here's what we're getting ready to see. And, and this is why the message of, of 2 John is so powerful. Because in the message of 2 John, John takes a, a simple concept like love. And then here's what he's going to do. He's going to tie it in with this other simple concept of truth. And here's what we're going to see the rest of the message. He's going to put truth and love together. In fact, you're going to see the great connection of love in truth. And so let, let's remind ourselves, we, we talked about truth. What is truth? Truth, it, it, walking in truth is to walk according to the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is truth. We remember that? We got that down. The word of God is truth, so walking in truth is walking according to the word of God. Do you see how closely the two are connected? Look back at verse 6. If you don't see it, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. And so what are the commandments, church? Truth. The commandments are truth. They are his word. And so here's what we see. The connection between love and truth is this, is that love is walking in truth. Do you see how closely the two are connected? This is what John's wanting us to know this morning. He says, look, this is simple. This is a commandment you've heard before. And yes, I'm going to talk about truth, but he says you need to see the connection between the two. Why? Because they're going to come and play at the end of this letter because there's something dangerous that's happening within the society. There's something dangerous that's happening within the church. And so John, he starts his letter with a great greeting, but then he says, let me tell you about the connection between love and the connection between truth because guess what? It's going to help you at the very end of this letter. And so here's our key principle if you're taking notes. The whole sermon could be summarized as this. In order for us to love, there has to be truth. It, church, in order for us to truly love, there has to be truth involved. When, um, with Halloween coming up, I, uh, man, I get, I get to thinking about candy. I don't know about y'all. I go through Kroger, and, and there's these bags of, uh, of delicious candies, and y'all know me, man, I'm a big chocolate guy. I, hey, Skittles, I ain't messing with Skittles. I ain't messing with Starburst. Y'all can save those for yourself. Give me the chocolate. And so this week, I came across this article, and as I was reading this article, it caught my attention uh, because this article, it was from candystore.com, and they have taken 15 years of research, okay? 15 years of research and data, and now they have come up with what is the best or favorite candy in every state during this time of year. And you'd be, oh my gosh, I need, I need to post this graphic. Maybe I can post it on social media today. The graphic of what state in their favorite, most popular candy in, it blew my mind. In fact, I'll give you one of them. Uh, I think they're called, what are they called? Hot tamales. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I feel like that's probably the most disgusting candy in, in all the world. Like, like, who likes, I've never even seen anybody eat a hot tamale. Now, now somebody in here, you're probably like eating them right now out of your purse, and you're like, hey, sir. I love hot tamale. I've, I seriously, I've never seen anybody buy or eat a hot tamale. But for some reason, there are like four different states that that's their number one candy. In fact, I was looking, it was, I think, Minnesota and North Dakota. Their favorite candy was hot tamale, which this is how pitiful that is. Those children are so cold up there that, that the only source of heat they have is hot tamales. No wonder it's the favorite. But the northern states Whatever their favorite candy is, why it's hot tamales, I don't know. But hey, Kentucky, I believe we have it right. I believe we do. 
Yeah, what, what's Kentucky's favorite candy? Do y'all know? Like, yell them out. I heard Snickers. I heard Reese's. What else? Chocolate. Just regular Hershey chocolate. All right, y'all pretty close. Some of y'all are really close. Kentucky's favorite candy is the classic Reese cup. It's the classic Reese's cup. I mean, who raise your hand if you love a good Reese's cup? Jameson, I saw you going crazy, and I'll give this to you because your dad's a deacon. And he can't sue me if you're allergic to peanut butter. <laughs> there you go, Jameson. You can have that. Hopefully, it's not melted. It's been in my pocket for a while. The favorite candy is Reese's cup. Now, think about a Reese's cup. I love Reese's because me personally, I'm a chocolate guy. And, and so Reese's, you, you got the chocolate. But Reese's is a simple, I mean, it's simple ingredients. It, it is, what, what is it? It's chocolate and what else? Peanut butter. You, you can't have a, re if you just have chocolate, you just got a Hershey Kiss. And Hershey Kisses, they're okay, but they're always a last case scenario. After three months of Christmas candy's gone, all that's left is a Hershey Kiss. That's when you eat them. Hershey Kiss, I, I like chocolate, but that's not what I want to eat. I want to eat the beautiful combination of what? The chocolate and the peanut butter. You can't have a Reese's Cup without chocolate, but definitely can't have a Reese's Cup without peanut butter. Church, I want you to understand, if we think about the Reese and we relate it to today's message, understand you can't have love without truth. In other words, peanut butter is the truth that we need to our chocolate. A Reese's is not the same without peanut butter. And in the same way, love is not love without truth. So, so here's the issue. There's a connection between truth and love. John paints this picture, and he, he's emphasizing it. He's wanting you to see that connection. But let's see why. Look at verse 7. Verse 7, he says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is a deceiver and is the Antichrist. And so here's the issue happening in, in John. This is why he chose to truly write this letter. This is why he could not wait to see them face to face. He had to say, look, there are deceivers that are telling lies about Jesus. That there were deceivers in this time. In fact, he says they are the Antichrist. It's lowercase a, not capital A. But in other words, they are the Antichrist, meaning they are simply against the Messiah. Why? Because they are not walking in love. Why? Because they're not walking in truth. That these antichrists, these, these simply people that were against Jesus, they weren't walking in love because they weren't walking in truth. They believed that Jesus didn't really come in the flesh, which when we look at our scriptures, we understand that the word became flesh and the word dwelt among us. And so this is something contrary to the teaching that would have been going along in the early church during that time. But look at verse 9. Verse 9, he says, Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. So someone who does not obey the truth simply does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you who does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. John brings up the idea that they don't bring the teaching. In other words, they don't bring the truth. And because they did not bring the truth, he's telling this elect lady, whether it is a specific woman or whether it is a church congregation, either way, it doesn't matter. He's saying this. He says, don't receive them. In other words, John is saying, because there are deceivers out there who want to spread misinformation and don't want to spread the truth about God's word, he says this, do not tolerate them. In fact, it was dangerous for the church to be hospitable. Why? Because these false teachers were spreading lies about the faith. They were spreading lies about Christ. And so John gives a stern warning, do not receive them in your house. Here's my question, RS1. Who are you letting in your house? Think about this. Who are you letting inside your home? In, in, in this ancient civilization, in the time of Christ, and even the time after Christ with the early church, as John is writing this, this culture was hospitable by nature. In fact, the Jews, that they celebrated hospitality. It was a normal part of, of daily life. This was before Airbnbs, before you had to pay to go in somebody's house. Used to, they used to let people come into your house without paying. This was something, they were very hospitable. Why? Because the desert was terrible, and it was rough conditions, and there were thieves and robbers out there. And this was a culture that, that traveled a lot. You didn't have a holiday inn on every corner. And so people practiced hospitality. 
hospitality. And though we don't practice hospitality like they did in ancient culture, and you might say, well, we have southern hospitality. Well, it's not comparison to what they had during this time. We still have to ask the question, who are we letting in our house? Because church, I believe we're letting people in every single day. You might say, Christian, I haven't had a visitor in years. Someone hasn't been in my house. I don't have people over for dinner. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying now in society today, every single moment, someone is coming through the door of our house. And it might not be the front door, but it's through the TV screen. It's through our social media. It's through our news apps. Whatever it might be, church, we are letting people in our house every single day. So we have to ask the question, who are we letting in? John was so worried about this church, he writes to them, he says, look, you got to understand truth, you got to understand love, and then you have to know this, there are people that are deceiving that you are letting into your house, and he says this, do not let them in. Church, be careful who you let in. Be careful who you put on your screen or who you put in front of you or the influencers you have in your life or, or the news stations that influence you or the politicians that influence you. Be careful who you let in. Why? Because they can say something contrary to God's word. Now, now the good thing is we can learn God's word, and if they say something contrary to God's word, then we can put that up against them, and then we can understand if they're being truthful or not. But if what they say or how they act I'll say that as well. If what they say or how they act, if it is contrary to the truth, which makes it contrary to love, then we need to have nothing to do with them in our houses. Now, now this is not to say that you should have an unbeliever over for dinner. I'm not saying that that that's the case. But but if there are these, and I'm just going to use, because we're not letting people in our homes in today's time, we're just going to use media and TV. If someone you say is not acting or following Christ, or they're saying something contrary to the word of God, or something contrary to the nature and character of Christ, then we need to be careful who we let in. In other words, we don't need to tolerate something or everything someone says. We don't need to tolerate everything culture says. Why? Because love is not toleration. It's not. Love is simply not toleration. If your kid comes to you uh, this afternoon w- w- with a hand, he's got matches in his hand, uh, and he says, hey, mama, I saw that gas tank out back. I'm going to play with it real quick, okay? Love you. What are you going to do? Are you going to tolerate that? Or are you going to let your kid take those matches and go out and play with a can of gasoline? Of course not. You're not. Even though they might want to, even though that's what they really desire, they want to see something go boom, even though they want to do that, you don't tolerate that. Rosie's at that stage now. It's that. Y'all know that stage? Like a little monkey picking up everything she grabs. She's putting in her mouth. As a father, do I tolerate letting her put everything in her mouth? No. Now, she gets by with a lot. I'll give her that. But the goal is for me is i got to protect her. That she might get mad at me because I take something small that she could choke on out of her mouth. But guess what? I still love her. Just because she wants to put whatever that coin is in her mouth and I take it away, that doesn't defeat the purpose that I love her so much. No, because love is not toleration. In fact, love is, as we saw in Scripture, it's walking in truth. Because love and truth are a team. In fact, love and truth, they are the dynamic duo. In fact, if we think about love, love is the biggest cheerleader of truth. Did you know that? Love, it cheers truth on. In fact, Scripture says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6. It says, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices in truth. Love cheers on truth. It's in support of truth. And if there is someone you know who's doing something that is contrary to God's word or says something that is completely against God's word, the most loving thing that we can do is to guide them to truth. The the most loving thing we can do is for our friends and family is to help guide them into truth because walking in truth is walking according to the word of God and walking in love is walking according to those commandments. Now, here's what we need to understand. When it comes to guiding people in truth, here's where we have to be careful. Because some people take this too far. Some people take the idea of truth and they slam it down people's faces without love. But look what Paul says, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. We continue to see the connection of love and truth in Scripture. Verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 4, he says, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Doctrine is simply a fancy word for the set of beliefs that we have as Christians. And so he says, look, we don't want to be like these children who are passed back and forth by different doctrines or different beliefs 
about the scriptures and rather instead of being tempted by human cunning and craftiness verse 15 says we rather we need to speak the truth in love and so there's a fine line between speaking the truth and speaking the truth in love right we we understand that we understand that we see that in people's lives in fact some of us we love to speak the truth we love telling people that they're wrong i think that's the wrong way to go about it it's not the idea of, oh, I like to tell people they're wrong. It's, we, we need to have the mindset, oh, oh, I want to point people to what is true and right. And we have to do so in love. We have to do this in, in a loving way. If we speak the truth, but we haven't done so in a loving manner, we've defeated the whole purpose of telling truth. And so whether this is by what we post or by what we say, this is based on our political views or our thoughts about a specific topic. We have to understand, yes, it might be truthful, but are you saying it in a loving way? Because if you're not saying it in a loving way, you've defeated the whole purpose. You've lost the person you're trying to reach. Church, there's this fine connection between truth and love. If you're going to love, you've got to have truth. And if you're going to speak the truth, you have to have love. I'll finish with this. I know there's other connections in Scripture, but I'll finish with one of the more obvious ones. In 1 John chapter 4, 8, we see God is love. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says this. He says, I am the way, I am the truth. And on the cross, the truth himself, the truth, he demonstrated his own love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for me and you. Church, church this morning, you, you can understand that the truth himself, who is also love himself because he was God, he died on the cross for our sin. The truth himself, he, he died. Why? Because of the love that he had for me and you. That this morning, if you haven't given your life to Christ, understand that the truth is this. The truth is that we're all sinners. The truth is we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the truth is that there is a Savior who died on the cross for our sins. He rose again from the grave, and he gives you a chance to accept him. And so this morning, if you would like to be saved as we sing this last song, I encourage you, I'm going to be up here. If you would like to give your life to Christ this morning, if you would like to, to just give your life to the truth himself, you can do that. Why? Because of what he did out of love for us. And so let me pray, Father. We thank you for truth and love, God, and sometimes truth is hard, and sometimes it's hard to love. But Lord, help us to be a church to where we, we focus on what is true, what comes from your word. But God, we do so in a loving way. And, and so God, I, I pray that First Baptist, we are marked. God, God that, that our lives, when people come to this church, that they recognize two things. They recognize they preach the truth, they teach the truth, and they do it in love. God, I pray that this community, Russell Springs, would see, God, that the most loving people in this town are the people that come out of this church. God, that you may be glorified and that people may be saved. And so we ask that. And so this morning, God, as you're working on hearts, God, people have heard the truth, not, not from me, God, but from your word. And now, God, I pray that they would respond to that love in that way that you have loved them. God, if there's someone in here who's not accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, God, would you help them to do that today? God, would you convict their hearts? God, give them the courage to come down and talk with me or Brother Jarek. We just pray that. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your precious name, amen. You may stand. If you want to give your life to Christ, you can do so today. If you want to be baptized and join the church, uh, you can do that today as well.
Amen. You may be seated. Church, uh, I just want you to know we love you. I hope you have a great week. I'm going on vacation this week, and so uh, Reverend Corey Hayes is going to be preaching on out of the book of 3 John, and so we're excited for him. Me and Jarek will be out as well. Jarek has a work trip, uh, and so if you need anything, Jarek's gone, I'm gone, Danielle's gone, Johnny's gone, Susie, <laughs> it's all on you this week, all right? Or find a deacon, they will be sure uh, to help you guys as well. Just want you to know I love you. Continue praying for our baptism goal, uh, that God will continue to use people and save people. Like we had a woman come into our office this week, and she gave her life to the Lord. And so she's getting baptized right now at, uh, I can't remember the name of the church, but somewhere in Russell Springs, it's her home church. Uh, and so God is moving, uh, and so we ask that you would continue to pray. Stacy, you want to close us out? Or you want me to close this out? You got it. <laughs> Let's all stand as we sing the doxology. Praise God for- 